time has come when I can pause to worship the Spirit, Father, Son and celebrate the birth of earth and sky and sea and all of God's creation a special time for me when heaven comes to earth. Ooh, oh, at last the time is here. The week is almost ended And holy Sabbath cheer Fills the universe The angels gather near But not many people notice The joy that fills the when heaven comes to earth every seventh day the Sabbath day I cast all my cares away and Jesus comes to be with me a sample of eternity oh I can hardly wait to go where every day is like Sabbath but I'll wait because I know what life is really worth and when I see his face forever I'm gonna praise him for his goodness and his grace when heaven comes when heaven comes to earth. Thank you, Nabel. Wonderful song. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Welcome here. This is night 11 of the Time is at Hand Bible Prophecy Seminar. Tonight's meeting is a big one. I think all these meetings are big ones, aren't they? So here's another big one. So let's open our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We are going to be studying the topic of solving the mystery of death. That's the title. We're gonna be talking about something that I would assume all of us are interested in because if Jesus doesn't come soon, we are all gonna die. Death is something we cannot avoid, we cannot escape. But thank the Lord, for Jesus, because of Jesus Christ, we have a strong hope. Amen. So I'm gonna put a lot of pieces together tonight and try to unravel an issue that is um, confusing to many, and we'll look at, see what the Bible has to say. So let's bow our heads, and let's pray. Let's ask God to help us and to bless us. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another chance to be here in Mansfield, Texas, with my family, to share the word of the Lord. 
and we pray for your blessing. Please be with us now. Please help me as I open my Bible and open my mouth and my heart and share your word with this group. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I'm going to start out with a little story about a young boy. I don't know how old he was, but he was probably maybe 10, 10 years old, like my, my son, just turned 10 a couple days ago. And he was wandering around one day in a cemetery, reading tombstones. You ever done that? It's interesting to see sometimes what people have inscribed upon their stones. And anyway, this young boy uh, noticed one particular stone that really caught his eye. And so he knelt down to take a close look, and it was the stone of a man named Paul Adams. There the date is on the screen. He was born in 1902 and died in 1964. And this is what he had written on his stone. He said, stop, my friend, as you go by. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you soon shall be. So prepare yourself to follow me. That's what he wanted on that stone. Well, that little boy was a rather smart young man, and he decided to respond. So he took out of his pocket a little orange marker, and this is what he wrote. He wrote on the stone, to follow you, I am not content until I know just where you went. (laughs) Isn't that good? Smart boy. So that brings up the question, the big question, the the biggest question of all, at least one of them, uh, where did Paul Adams go? Where does anybody go when they die? Uh, There are certainly a lot of ideas. In the religious world and in the secular world, There are those that believe you go up or down or back around or you go into the spirit world, you become a ghost, you can come back and forth and talk to people at will. There are others that believe that you don't go anywhere, that you're gone forever. And what we have to do tonight is we have to take a look at the Bible and see what the Bible has to say because my conviction is that the Bible is the most authoritative voice when it comes to this subject. Who knows more what happens after death than God, who inspired his book? So let's take a look and see what the Bible says. 1 Thessalonians chapter four, we'll start with verse 16. Verse 16 says, the Lord himself, and we talked about this a couple nights ago, that Jesus himself will descend. One of these days, he's coming down. Hallelujah. (laughs) He's up there now, but he's coming down. He will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet, the trumpet of God. And then what does Paul say will happen when that trumpet sounds? He says, he wrote, Paul wrote, and the dead in Christ will rise. That's right, they will rise first. Now, obviously, this is referring to believers in Jesus. Wouldn't you agree? These, this is talking about the dead in Christ. Now, not everybody who dies is one of the dead in Christ, and we'll talk later on about what happens to those who die who are not in Christ. But this verse is talking about those who die in Christ, and if any of us do die before Jesus comes, we want to make sure that we are among the dead who die in the Lord, who die in Christ. Now, this verse is definitely talking about believers, and notice what it says about them. Paul wrote that the dead in Christ will do what? They will rise, that's right. Now, they must be down, and they're coming up. Uh, The concept is resurrection, the resurrection of the dead. The concept of the resurrection of the dead is mentioned over 100 times in the New Testament. It's a very common biblical doctrine. Just a couple of quick references. Uh, John 11, verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4, Paul said that Jesus died, he was buried, and he rose again from the dead. Matthew 28, verse 7, on resurrection morning, the angel told the women who went to the tomb that Jesus is risen from the dead. Uh, Acts chapter 24, verse 15, Paul said there will be a resurrection of the dead, both the just and the unjust, that both groups are going to rise. And Paul said the same thing here, that the dead in Christ will rise first. Verse 17 says, then we who are alive and remain. 
And I've mentioned this before, that my, my goal is to be alive when Jesus comes. I really would prefer not to die. I would like to be alive. I'm trying to take care of myself, trying to be as healthy as I can. Uh, I'm trusting the Lord, and I want to live as long as possible, and hopefully I'll see Jesus, comes without, see Jesus come without dying. I want to be among this group. But regardless, I want to be in Jesus. Verse 17 says, Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together. And the word together, together with them, means together with those who are resurrected. With the dead in Christ and then the living are caught up together. It's a reunion day. Reunion day. It's caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, Paul says, we shall what? We shall always be with the Lord. I think the King James says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The dead who are raised, the living who are caught up together, we're going to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. Now, uh, according to this text, and we're going to look at a lot of issues tonight, but according to this verse in verse 17, when does Paul say that believers get to be with Jesus? That's right, it's at the resurrection, when Jesus comes down, the dead are raised, and when we are caught up together, that's when we get to be with the Lord. And in the next verse, he says this is a very comforting truth. Verse 18, he says, wherefore, comfort one another with these words. These words have been given by, by God to comfort us in time of loss. Now, let's keep going. We've got a lot to do tonight. We're just laying the foundation. Let's go to Genesis all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, and let's look at Genesis chapter 2, and we'll go to verse 7. You do that while I tie my shoelace up here. I undid my shoelace, and I don't want to walk around with it hanging out like that. I don't want to take a chance in uh, tripping and falling in front of you. All right, Genesis chapter 2. Let's talk about the, the topic of the soul. We really can't understand death without understanding the soul. What does the Bible say about the soul? Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And according, this is a King James on the screen here, it says, man became what? He became a living soul. Some Bibles say living being. King James says living soul. The actual Hebrew word for soul here is, uh, is nephesh. Nephesh, man became a living soul. And if you look closely at this verse, there's actually a formula that is described here. First, God took the dust. So here we have the dust of the ground. And he formed Adam, but Adam wasn't breathing yet. And then God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And then it says man became a living soul. So the dust plus the breath of life resulted in man being a living soul. Now based upon just this text, would you say that man uh, had a soul or that he was a soul? based on this text. Did he have a soul or was he a soul? It says he became. When the dust was combined with the breast, he became something. He became a living soul. There's another verse in Leviticus that illustrates how in Scripture, and I'll show you many other verses. Let's look at Leviticus 23, verse 30. It's on the screen, but I think we should look at it in our Bibles. Actually, keep your finger there in Genesis because we're going to come back to that, that chapter. But if you look at Leviticus 23, some verses I'll just put on the screen and we'll go through them quickly, but others we need to actually turn and take a look. Leviticus 23, verse 30. And I've got the New King James. 23:30, the Bible says, any person, that's what the New King James says. Who has the King James? Anybody? Okay, and what does the King James says? Any what? Now, that's not the King James. You don't have the King James. Who has the King James version? Whatsoever soul it be. Right, that doeth any work on that day, that soul 
shall be destroyed among the people. Right, the uh, New King James says person, the King James says soul, and it's obvious from the text that it's not talking about a ghost that's floating around. It's talking about the person. Any soul who does uh, work on the Day of Atonement, that person or that soul will be destroyed among the people. Uh, that's just one text. There are many other verses, and I'll show you a few more quickly. We'll just go through these that illustrate that in Scripture, the word soul many times is used in reference to the person, such as Acts 27, verse 37. It says in the King James that all, in all the ship that uh, Paul and Luke were on, there were 200, three score, and 16 souls. Now, this doesn't mean that there were 276 ghosts on the ship. It means there were 276 people that were on that ship. Here's another reference in Acts chapter 3, verse 23. Peter was quoting the Old Testament about Jesus, and he said, every soul which will not hear that prophet, referring to Christ, shall be destroyed from among the people. So the soul will be destroyed, but this is a reference to people that don't listen to Jesus as Jesus is the Messiah and he's the ultimate fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 20 says that in the days of Noah, eight souls were saved by water. Eight souls walked up and went through the door and got into the ark. Now, again, that doesn't mean that eight uh, spirits or ghosts, you know, walked up the plank. It's referring to people. People were the souls. And we use this illustration many times. Have you ever heard anybody say about, let's say, an old man, he meets an old man, and he'll say, that, that man, is a, he's a kind soul. He's a very kind soul. Have you ever heard expressions like that? When a person says he's a kind soul, he doesn't mean that there's, he's not referring to some kind of an entity inside the body. He's referring to the person himself, that a, the person is a kind, a kind soul. Uh, I heard about a preacher once that had a big meeting in a big tent, and he was preaching to this large crowd, and he told the crowd, he said, tomorrow I am going to show you a soul, so make sure that you're here. And I tell you, the next night, the tent was packed. There were all kinds of people. Word had gotten around town that this preacher was going to show the crowd a living soul. So when they all walked in and sat down, there was, they saw a, ba a basket on the, uh, on the platform. And so the preacher started preaching, and he started showing them different Bible verses. He started talking about death. He showed them verses like this, and then he told them, he said, folks, inside this basket, underneath this lid, there is a soul. And in a minute, I'm going to lift up the lid, and the soul's going to come out. So get ready. And everybody was just, you know, they were holding their breath. And when the time was right, the preacher lifted up that lid, and guess what happened? His little boy was, was uh, hiding in that basket. And when the lid came off, the little boy went, yeah! <laughs> he stood up and he yelled, and the preacher said, there he is, a living soul. And he used that to illustrate what the Bible says, that a soul refers to a person. And there are many, many other verses that say the same thing. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 2. And here we're going to get into the controversy, the great controversy between Jesus and Satan. Genesis chapter 2, and then we'll get to chapter 3. 2.16. Genesis 2.16. Now, this was the first warning that was given to man after God made him from the dust of the ground, put the breath of life into him. Adam became a living soul. He, uh, he was about to name the animals, but God gave him a warning. In verse 17, the Bible says, or verse 16, says that the Lord God commanded the man, and he said, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat. You're free to eat all the good food that you have in the garden. And then he said, uh, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that one tree you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, what did God say would happen to Adam? He said, you will surely die. That's right. That was the command and the warning. God gave him a warning. He said, Adam, 
You are, I made you, you are a living soul, but if you eat from this tree, if you fail and do this one thing that I'm telling you not to do to show that you love me as a test of your obedience, he said, if you do that one thing and if you commit a sin, he said, you will, you will surely die. Now remember, Adam was a living soul and God told the living soul that you'll die. Is it possible for a living soul to die? Here's another reference from Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4, where God says that the soul that sins, what will happen to it? It shall die. die. That's right. So is it possible for a soul to die? The Lord gave this warning. But now notice, if you look at chapter 3, what happens is the plot thickens and the serpent comes into the garden. Genesis chapter 3, the serpent. And I, ladies, I don't, I don't mean to gross you out from that picture. I've had some ladies say, don't show that picture in your meetings of a snake. It's just, ah. Well, I'm not, I'm, you know, I understand that a lot of people are scared of snakes, but it's just a picture. <laughs> just a picture. In Genesis 3 verse 1, the Bible says the serpent was more cunning. He was very subtle, very cunning. He came into the garden. Now, of course, who was the real enemy? Was it really the snake or was it someone behind the snake? It was someone behind the snake, that's right. It was, it was the serpent. And Eve struck up a dialogue with this talking snake. And in verse 4, notice what the serpent said to the woman. The serpent said to the woman, he said, you will not, what? Surely die. That's right, you will not surely die. Eve told the snake that God had said that if they ate from that fruit, they would die, and then the serpent challenged that statement. He challenged the Lord, challenged the word of God, and said, you will not surely die. Now, this is very significant that this was actually the first lie that the serpent ever told the human race, that Satan ever told the human race. There are no lies in Genesis chapter 1 or in chapter 2 or at the very beginning of chapter three until you get to this, uh, this quote. This was the first lie Satan ever told and it had to do with death. It was a death lie. Basically, he was saying that if you sin, you won't die like the Lord said. Now, so there's Eve now. She had just heard, she had heard what the serpent said. The Bible says God commanded the man about not eating the fruit and I'm sure that Adam told his wife what God had said. And so here is Eve now, standing before this tree, listening to this uh, talking snake, and now she has two voices in her head rolling around. One voice is the voice of God that says, if you eat, you will surely die. And then she also has the voice of the serpent in her head rolling around that says, you will not surely die. And it's interesting that both God and the serpent said, almost the same thing except for one word. The word was not, that's right. That's the only difference. God said you will surely die. Satan said you will not surely die. Just that one little word, but the difference, the difference was uh, seismic between the two of them. So now she's got two voices in her head. And which one is she gonna follow? And let me ask you, have you ever felt like you've had two, two voices in your head? Do you ever feel like, you know, God's talking to you, but the serpent's talking to you as well? Uh, I, I'm assuming most of you have experienced that. I certainly have. We are all in a battle between good and evil. And we have God trying to reach us. We have the devil trying to reach us. Both sides are contending for the control of our minds. And we have to make a choice whose voice we're going to listen to. Isn't that right? We have to decide which voice are we going to obey. Well, anyway, what voice did Eve choose to obey. She sadly chose the wrong voice and it was a terrible choice that she made. I mean, it was the biggest mistake that has ever been made by any human being, you know, ever really was her, her first choice and then it went downhill, went downhill from there. She believed the serpent, took the fruit, ate it, handed it to Adam. Adam had to make a choice between what God had said and what the serpent had said and what Eve was now saying, he had to choose between God and his wife and that was a really difficult choice and Adam finally chose to follow his wife instead of the Lord. Another uh, terrible decision for him to make. Now I believe that we need to listen to our wives, husband, you know, but there does come a time when you have to make a choice to follow God first. 
And that's a choice we all have to make. Women, men, all of us, we all have to make that choice as well. Well, uh, Adam chose to make the wrong choice, and as, as a result of that, sin entered the world. So God came back into the garden, had quite a conversation with both of them. We're not going to read the whole thing right now, but if you go down to verse, chapter 3, verse 19, God sadly told Adam, he said, in the sweat of your face you will eat bread until you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. God made him out of the dust, and God said, because you've sinned, you are going, you are going back to the dust. Uh, have you ever heard at funerals where the minister will say, ashes to ashes, dust to dust? This is where it comes from. It comes out right here from, from the Bible. Because of sin, humanity is now, the word is mortal. We are mortal, which means subject to death. If you look up the word mortal in a dictionary, that's what it means. We are subject to death. Uh, we are not naturally immortal. Here's a number of Bible verses. 1 Timothy chapter 6.16 says that God is the only one who has immortality, which means not subject to death. Here's another text. Uh, Romans chapter 2 verse 7, Paul said that we are to seek for immortality. And we seek it through Jesus Christ. We seek it through the gospel. Here's another verse in 1 Corinthians 15, 53, which we'll look up later before we're done again. Paul said that on resurrection day, this mortal will put on immortality on resurrection morning. He said the corruptible will put on incorruption and the mortal will put on immortality. So we become immortal on resurrection day. <clears throat> but because of sin, we still have to wait. We have to wait until that day. Now, you're still in Genesis. Turn to chapter 5. Genesis 5, verse 5. Genesis 5, 5. This is a very interesting verse. We have to look closely at it. Many years later, after Adam and Eve chose to sin and a lot happened in the interim, Genesis 5, 5 says, So all the days that Adam lived, they were 930 years. Wow, he lived a long time. <laughs> he was more than a, uh, what do they call them, uh, Sen centennial, C cen how do you say that? Centurions who have reached 100 years. Well, Adam reached 900 years. 900 years, the Bible says. He lived 930 years, and then what does it say happened to him? The Bible says, and he did what? He died. He died. That's right. Pretty simple and straightforward. He died. So who was right? God. Was God right or was the serpent right? God. The serpent said, if you eat this fruit, you won't die. Uh, Adam ate the fruit, and the Bible says he died, and Eve also died, and we've been dying ever since. Isn't that right? Yes. People have been dying ever since, so we know that God told the truth, not the devil. The devil gave his first lie, but it was a lie. It was not true, because Adam died. That's what the Bible says. Now, notice, he lived, and remember, he was a living soul, yes. so he was a living soul for 930 years. And then he died, and when he died, what was he? If he was a living soul, and then he died, what was he? He would be a dead soul. Right, he, he, he died, and he went, he went back to the dust. Death is very real. I think we all know that. Every city or town or, you know, they're all around the world, there are cemeteries. Cemeteries are the proof in front of us that God told the truth and that the devil lied, and that death is the result of sin. We know that. Death is the result of sin. Now, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Remember, there's somebody that denies that. He started denying that in the garden, and he's been denying that ever since. He's still denying that today. Revelation chapter 12, verse 9 talks about the devil being cast out of heaven. 12.9 says the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, which brings your mind back where? The to the Garden of Eden. That's right, that, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan. And then notice it says that he deceives how many people? He deceives the whole world. That's right. Now, he first he deceived Eve. And his first lie 
was right here. First lie, you will not surely die. And the Bible says not only did he, did he deceive Eve, but Scripture says he deceives the whole world. And it sure seems to me as I put these pieces together that one of the devil's deceptions has to do with the subject of death. Doesn't it make sense that he wants to confuse us <clears throat> about that very subject? That's how he got Eve. He tricked her. And he, he was successful back then, and he is trying to do the same thing today. So we need to be very careful, and we need to study our Bibles for ourselves to make sure that what we believe is really biblical. Are you with me? We've got to make sure it's according to the Bible. Okay, next question. Uh, when, a soul, when a person or a soul dies, can a dead soul continue to think after death? Let's see what the Bible says. I want to show you some verses on the screen, but I want you to look up Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. Let's look this up in our Bibles. I want you to see this. I don't want to just rattle off texts on the screen only, I want to actually have you look into your Bibles. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 5. 9, 5. Notice what the Bible says. Solomon wrote this. He said, for the living know that they will die. And isn't that true? We do know that if we're thinking clearly, at least, we know, and I know some kids think they're immortal. You know, they can do whatever they want. But if we're thinking clearly, we know that one of these days, if Jesus doesn't come first, we're going to die. But then Solomon continues and says, but the dead, how much do they know? Yeah, Solomon said, but the dead know not anything. And then he said, uh, he goes on and says, they have no more reward. The memory of them is forgotten. Also their love, their hatred, their envy is now perished. And they will not have a share anymore in what is done under the sun. If you look at verse 9, or verse 10, verse 10, he continues, continues and says, whatever your hand finds to do while you're alive, do it with your might, for there is no work or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. That is a pretty, pretty uh, clear text. Now, when the Bible says we don't know anything when we die, <clears throat> have you ever, let me just ask you, have, have, have any of you here ever blacked out? You ever totally lost consciousness any time in your life? Okay, you have. A couple of you have. I, I did. One time I was playing basketball, and I went up underneath the hoop, and somebody came down with his elbow, hit me right in the nose, and I was out. And the next thing I knew, I was laying flat, flat on my back, and I opened my eyes, and I looked up, and I saw all these people looking down on me. And then I, you know, I came to. But I can tell you, from the time that the elbow hit my nose to the time that I looked up, I had no idea what was going on. I mean, my, I, I was blacked out. And I, I, didn't, I didn't remember anything. Some people black out and they, they come to, you know, a day or two later. And if you ask them, you know, what happened during the two days, they're clueless. Um, it is possible for the mind to stop thinking so that, so that thought completely ceases. That's what happened to me when I was on the basketball court, and that's what the Bible says happens at death. The dead know not anything. Here's some other verses. Psalm 146, verse 4, says that when a person dies, it's, the Bible says his thoughts perish. He stops thinking entirely. Here's another verse. Psalm 115, verse 17, David said that the dead go down into silence. Here's another verse, Psalm 6, verse 5, that says, in death there is no remembrance of thee, of you. For in the grave, who shall give you thanks? And there are many, many other verses like this, which we'll give you in the study guide. Psalm 13, verse 3, David applies the word sleep to death. He prayed that his enemies wouldn't get the best of him, and he said, Lord, uh, help me not to, to sleep the sleep of death. I would like to stay alive for a while. The Bible uses this word many, many, many times in reference to death. Here's just a few more. Acts 7, verse 60 talks about Stephen, same name as me. He preached a uh, rather controversial sermon 
which I do too sometimes. And back in Acts chapter 7, a whole lot of people didn't like that sermon and they finally stoned him to death. Please don't do that to me. <laughs> but they just, you know, they stoned him and the Bible says that at the end of the stoning, he fell asleep. Acts chapter 7, verse 60. Here's another verse. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 6, that when Jesus rose from the dead, he said at least about 500 people saw him in his resurrected form, and he said some of them are still alive, but many of them have fallen asleep. And he's referring to those witnesses of the resurrection they had died. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14, Paul describes those who die believing in Christ, that they are sleeping in Jesus. They sleep in Jesus. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, which we read last night. Was it last night? When were we last here? Yes, it was last night. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. I read this verse during the question box period where Paul said, we will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trumpet, the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we will be changed. So many, many times, and there are many other verses, the Bible talks about death as a sleep. Now, if you think about it, that's actually a rather comforting idea, to think of death as sleep. Because when you're asleep, you're not in pain. You know, you might be in pain before you finally go out, <laughs> But when you're out, the pain is over. You know, you're not, you're not in pain when you are asleep and you're not, you're not suffering. Uh, also, when you are asleep, you have no idea what's going on around you. Isn't that true? And I can prove that if there's anybody out there that happens to be sleeping during my sermon. <laughs> that little boy's not asleep, he's still awake. There's nobody sleeping, but if, if there was someone, let me just make sure, I, no, you're all, I'm keeping you all awake, but let's just say somebody here on the front row, let's say this brother was sound asleep in my sermon. If he was asleep, I guarantee you he would not know what I was saying, right? He wouldn't know anything about what's going on around you because when you're asleep, you just, you just don't know. Now, the big question, according to the Bible, is the biblical question is when a person dies, goes back to the dust, their thoughts cease, they don't know anything, and they're sound asleep, the big question, according to the Bible, is, is that it? You know, atheists believe that's it. When you die, you're dead, gone forever. Is that it, or is there hope that the dead will someday wake up? That's the question, and what does the Bible say? There's a great text in the book of Daniel Turn to Daniel. Again, I could just quote it, but I want you to see it because it's just so, it's so significant. Daniel chapter 12, and let's look at verse 2. Daniel 12, 2, last chapter of the book of Daniel. Daniel said that at the very end of the world, verse 2 says, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall do what? they will awake. See that? It says they're sleeping, and here's the verse on the screen now. They're sleeping, and that's when they're dead, but he says many of them will wake up, right? So when they die, they're asleep, and someday they wake up. They're awake. That's what the Bible says. It says this many, many times. Now, if you think about it, uh, another good thought about this is that when a person is asleep, they have no consciousness, not only of what's going on around them, but also of the passing of time. A person can go to bed at night, you know, finally you're asleep, and then, you know, you kick yourself because the alarm clock goes off and you thought you just went to bed. You thought, man, I want to sleep some more. Is it morning already? You ever had that experience? Is it morning already? So when a person is asleep, from the time that they go to sleep and then they wake up, they have no idea how much time has passed. So let's say someone, someone died uh, 2,000 years ago, or 3,000, or 4,000, and then they go to sleep, and then when Jesus comes and resurrects them, they're, they're not aware that they've been out for 4,000 years. They have no knowledge. As far as they know, you know, it's like the alarm clock just went off and it's time to wake up. And so if you think about it, from that perspective, it really doesn't matter whether a person dies 4,000 years ago, or 1,000 years ago, or 100 years ago, or yesterday, or today, because the next thing they'll know is it's resurrection morning, just like that. No pain, no suffering, 
no uh, consciousness of the passing of time, all of a sudden, it's the big day. It's resurrection morning. Now, what did Jesus say about this, to this topic? Of course, Jesus is the greatest authority of all. He actually did die, and he actually rose from the dead. So he knows. He knows more than anybody else. Let me just uh, show you some verses. And in fact, I want us to look this one up too. Turn to John chapter 5. John 5. Got to look up John 5. And then I'll show you some more verses on the screen. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Jesus said, these words are so powerful. <clears throat> Jesus said, do not marvel at this. In other words, don't be amazed. For the hour is coming, Jesus said, in which all who are in their graves will hear his voice. So where are they? They're in their graves. How many are in their graves? All who are in their graves will hear his voice. And when they hear his voice, what will happen? They're going to come forth. That's right, they're coming out. They're coming out of the graves. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life. That's the good resurrection. And those who have done evil, they come out to what resurrection? The resurrection of some Bible say condemnation or damnation. Now here, notice there's two resurrections, right? There's the good resurrection and the bad resurrection. And tomorrow night, if you'll be here, please come tomorrow night. I will prove to you right from the Bible, plain as day, clear as a bell, right in front of you, that the thousand years in Revelation 20 is a time period in between the good resurrection and the bad resurrection. I'll show that to you as crystal clear as I possibly can. But we have to understand this topic before we get to that topic. And then we have to understand that topic before we get to the last topic on hell. Because they all go, they all go right together. Now, notice also in John chapter 6, John chapter 6, verse 39, Jesus said, This is the will of the Father who has sent me. Of all that he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Jesus is talking about those who believe in him. He said they'll be resurrected on the last day. In verse 40, he says the same thing. At the end of the verse, I will raise him up at the last day. In verse 44, at the end of the verse, Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. In verse 54, at the end of the verse, Jesus says, I will raise him up at the last day. So here's four times in one chapter where Jesus said that those who believe in him, he will raise them on the last day. Amen. Pretty powerful, isn't it? Pretty potent. Jesus Christ certainly believed in the resurrection. And one thing that really impresses me, that if I do die before Jesus comes and if I get laid to rest, you know, how am I getting out of the grave? Can I get myself out? Can you get yourself out? The only way if you die that you're coming out is through the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That tells us that we are totally dependent upon him. Amen. Totally dependent on him, not just to save us, to give us eternal life, but to get us out of the ground if we die. Amen. I tell you, we need Jesus, don't we? Amen. We need him. We need him more than we realize. Okay, I just showed you those, uh, those scriptures, John chapter 6, 39, 40, 44, and 54. Jesus said he'd raise up those who believe in him on the last day. Luke 14, 14, he talked about those who do good to those who are in need. He said, you shall be rewarded at the resurrection of the just. So Jesus said this over and over again. It's very, very clear that Jesus certainly did teach the resurrection of the dead. Now, some of you may be thinking, all right, Steve, I'm following you right along, but I've got a big question in my head. What about the thief on the cross? And what about the rich man and Lazarus? And what about when Paul said it is, he wanted to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord? What about that? We're going to look up all those verses as quick as we can before we're done, because those are good questions, they're legitimate questions, and a lot of people ask those questions. So let's just quickly go into the rich man and Lazarus, although we're going to do this more in detail on Monday night. The story is in Luke chapter 16. 
Uh, and I want to first say, before we just quickly tackle this, that I, Steve Walpert, certainly believe what the Bible says about hell. The Bible is very clear that there is a hell and that it's a real hell and it really does burn. And I believe that. I totally believe that. And I'm going to talk about that on Monday night when we talk about the hot topic of hell. So we're going to get to that. But before we do, I want to give you four reasons why this particular story in the book of Luke is actually what the Bible calls a parable. And just in a nutshell, what happens is there's a rich man and he dies and he goes down into a hot place. There's a poor man and he dies and he's taken up by the angels and he's deposited in the bosom of Abraham. And then they start having this conversation back and forth and the rich man says, Father Abraham, please send uh, Lazarus to come down and take his finger and touch my tongue because I'm, I'm being tormented in this flame. And then Abraham gives his reasons why, no, well, that's not going to happen. And they have quite a conversation, and then it ends with, uh, with an important message about the resurrection. But we don't have time to read the whole thing, but it's in Luke chapter 16, and let me just give you four reasons why this is actually what people call a parable and what the Bible calls a parable. Four reasons why this is a parable. The text here in Luke 6, 6, uh, 16, 19, there's the, there it is. Jesus said there was a certain rich man. And then he tells the story. In Luke 12, 16, he spoke a parable about a certain rich man. In Luke 16, 1, he told about a certain rich man and told the parable of the unjust steward. In Luke 19, 11, and 12, he spoke a parable about a certain nobleman. In Luke 20, verse 9, he told the people this parable about a certain man who planted a vineyard. And so reason number one why the story of rich man and, the rich man and Lazarus is a parable because it starts just like Jesus starts parables, a certain rich man. Amen. Same thing. So that's one reason. Reason number two is what happens in the story. The rich man uh, dies and then the poor man is taken up by the angels and it's, the Bible says that he, was, he went into the bosom of Abraham. Now we can't obviously take that literally because if the, if the, if the poor man... Uh, went into the bosom of Abraham, what would that mean? That means he got deposited in Abraham's chest. And obviously, you know, that is a symbolic expression because you can't put one person into the chest of another person. Another reason is that you've got the, the, uh, the angels up there and uh, Lazarus, who is the poor man. Did I, did I say the rich man was Lazarus? Okay, good, I just want to correct that. It's the poor man, Lazarus, he goes up, the rich man goes down, and then they start having this conversation, back and forth. Uh, Abraham is talking to the rich man, and they're going back and forth. And can we actually believe that people up there and people down there can go back and forth and talk to each other? You know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't make sense. Now, here's another big reason is the request of the rich man. He's down there, and he looks up, and he sees uh, Lazarus in the bosom of Abraham, and he says, Father Abraham, please send Lazarus down here to take his finger and touch my tongue with water because I'm being tormented in this fire. Now, let me ask you, if you were literally being... Uh, engulfed in flames. How much comfort would it be to you to have a little bit of water touch your tongue? It wouldn't really help you at all. Not a bit. You would say, you know, send the bucket. Dump it on me because I'm, I'm really hot down here. Now, there's a reason for this, and we'll actually look up these verses on Monday night in the Bible, but the reason why Jesus told this parable is because right before that, it says that the Pharisees were mocked. Jesus said you can't love God and money. And the Pharisees were mocking him with their tongues. So Jesus told a story about a rich man who went down. They thought the rich man go up. Yeah. But here he tells a story to the rich man who goes down, about the rich man who goes down and the poor man who goes up. And the rich man's down there and he says, Father Abraham, I, I'm being tormented and touch my tongue. And Jesus was sending a message to the rich Pharisees who were mocking him with their tongues that if they keep on doing that, they're going to end up in the fire. They're going to end up in the fire. And there's a real lesson in that parable, uh, which you keep reading, you can learn that lesson. But the real lesson is not that a person goes into the bosom of Abraham. That's not, that's not the lesson. This is, this is a parable. Now, there is an account in the Bible, in John chapter 11, about a real man named Lazarus. A real Lazarus. And I think that's the reason why Jesus mentioned the name Lazarus because he was going to resurrect a real Lazarus, and they wouldn't believe it anyway. But the real man named Lazarus was sick, and Jesus said in John 11:11, 11, 11, he said, our friend Lazarus is sleeping. 
He told his disciples that. Lazarus is asleep. And the disciples thought, good, he's getting better. He, he's uh, resting now and he'll recover from his fever and everything will be fine. But that's not what Jesus meant. In uh, John 11, verse 14, it says, Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. This was a real Lazarus, not a story. And Jesus said he's asleep, and then he clarified he's dead. But this particular Lazarus who was dead was not going to stay dead for long. Uh, in John chapter 11, Jesus then finally went back, and he went to the tomb with Lazarus' sisters, Mary and Martha. And he said, roll that stone away. And Martha thought, thought, no, Lord, this is not a good idea. He's been dead for four days, and he smells. He's been in, in, the, in the grave for four days, and he stinks. This is not a good idea. But Martha didn't realize who it was who said, roll away that stone. She didn't realize who was standing in front of her. And so they, they complied, and they rolled away the stone. And then look at verse 43. Jesus looked into the darkness of that tomb. And in verse 43... The Bible says that when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice and he said, Lazarus, Lazarus, come forth. And then what happened? Everybody stood out there, frozen. Martha, Mary, other people, frozen at the tomb, looking into the darkness. What is going to happen? Is Jesus a liar, a lunatic, or is he really the Lord? Is he really the Lord? And there was, there was a stirring in that tomb when Jesus said, come forth. There was a stirring. And verse 44 says that he who had died came out, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said to them, loose him and let him go. Amen. Now let me just uh, share a few thoughts about this. Where was Lazarus when he died? Was he up there or was he in there? Amen. Now if he was up there, Jesus would have looked up and said, Lazarus, come down back into your body. But he didn't say that because Lazarus wasn't up there. Lazarus was right there. Now, I believe that if Jesus wouldn't, when he looked into that tomb, which was part of a cemetery, if Jesus wouldn't have specified who he was talking about, he said, Lazarus, just you come forth. If he wouldn't have specified that, if he would have just said, come forth in front of a cemetery, you know what would have happened? A whole lot of other people would have come forth. That's right, because the voice of Jesus Christ has power to raise the dead. But Jesus meant just Lazarus. Now think about this. If Lazarus was in heaven, enjoying himself up there, then why would Jesus bring him back down into a sinful body anyway? Wouldn't that be kind of cruel? Why not leave him up there? I mean, you'd think that he would be happier up there. And if he was up there, then how could he be up there and down there at the same time? How can you be in two places at the same time? And here's another thought. If when a person dies, they immediately go to heaven, then why does Jesus have to come back and resurrect the dead in the first place? Why does he say over and over and over again, if you believe in me, don't be afraid, I'll resurrect you on the last day? Why would he give us that, uh, that comforting assurance? Lazarus was dead and Lazarus came forth. And his resurrection is a sample of the resurrection of all believers on the great day when Jesus Christ comes again. Here's a verse that, that's probably almost as familiar to most Christians as John 3.16. And yet, a lot of times, we really just don't look carefully enough at what Jesus is saying. In John chapter 14, verse 2 and 3, Jesus said, In my Father's house there are many mansions. I'm going up there to prepare a place for you. How many of you have heard this text? It's a wonderful promise. Many Christians all around the world know this. I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus said. And then he said, if I go and prepare a place for you, and that means you and me, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So based on this text, when does Jesus say that we get to be with him? He says we get to be with him when he comes. 
He doesn't say, I'm going up there and I'll meet you there when you die. He doesn't say that. He says, I'm going up there, I'm making a place for you, and then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. And then I'm going to receive you. And you'll be with me. That wherever I am, that's where you will be. Once I was talking to a pastor about this who didn't believe uh, what I believe on this, and we were having quite a conversation. And I said, uh, Pastor, I said, what do you do with John 14, verses 1 to 3? And I read him these verses, and I said, look, Jesus said he's going up there, and he's coming back, and then we get to be with him. And I said, what do you do with that text? And I remember on the phone the silence, no response. He had no answer to this text. To me, this text is as clear as clear can be. Now, let's talk about the thief. Got to get to the thief on the cross, and then we'll finish with absent from the body. Uh, let's do this quickly. Turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 42. Luke 23, 42. What about the thief on the cross? Let's find out what Jesus actually said and what he didn't say. Luke chapter 23, verse 42. You remember the story where Jesus was hanging on the cross. He was getting close to death. There were two thieves on the right side and on the left. The Bible says both of them mocked him for a while, but one of them finally had a change of heart. He saw the way Jesus was responding. He saw the way Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He saw the love that was in this man. And finally, the Holy Spirit helped him put the pieces together, and he realized that the man that was crucified right next to him must be the Son of God. He must be the Son of God. And so he asked him something in verse 42. In verse 42, then he said to Jesus, he said, Lord, he called him Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, first of all, notice the question or the request. The, que the, the request was, Lord, remember me when? When you, come. when you come back. That's right. That's what he was hoping for. He was hoping that when Jesus returned that he wouldn't forget him. He wouldn't forget him. Now, verse 43 is Jesus' answer. And this answer can be read two different ways, depending upon a little tiny thing called a comma, a little punctuation issue. Now, before we actually read the text, and I show you we can look at it both ways, um, let me clarify that the Bible does not call itself the comma of God. The Bible calls itself the word of God, not the comma of God. Commas are not inspired. In fact, punctuation is not inspired. In fact, if you look at your Bible, and if you look at verse 43, how many of your Bibles have a four and a three there? Do your Bibles have a four and a three? Okay, now that four, four three was not written by Luke. When Luke wrote the book of Luke, he didn't write chapter one, verse one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He didn't do all that. What happened was later on when people... Uh, put the Bible together for us and helped us to understand it, they added chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, and they did that, and I'm glad because if I were to say count 1,500 verses and then we'll get to the same verse, you know, we'd have a hard time uh, studying the Bible together. So now I can say go to Luke chapter 23, verse 43, and we can find it. So that's good. But, but Luke, when he originally wrote the, the book of Luke, he did not write chapter 23, verse 42. That was added by men, and so were the commas. The commas were added by men as well. Now, here is the res Jesus' response in verse 43, and I've taken out the comma so I can show you how it can be read in two different ways. Jesus said to the thief, I tell you the truth today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, if you put the comma after the word truth, then he said, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise, meaning that very day. They're both going to paradise that day. But if you put the comma uh, after the word today, then you have Jesus saying, I tell you the truth today. I'm telling you right now that you will be with me in paradise, which is two different ways. So the question is, where should the comma go? Now, most Bibles put the comma before the word today. And that's the why people look at this and say, well, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, comma, today you'll be with me in paradise. Because that's where the comma is.
But I'm going to give you four reasons right now, four good reasons, why the comma should have been placed after the word today. Okay, reason number one is that Jesus Christ does not contradict himself. Jesus said, we'll get to be with him when he comes again. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, I'll resurrect you on the last day. And Jesus doesn't, doesn't contradict himself. Uh, reason number two is that Jesus did not go to paradise that day. He didn't. He was taken off the cross and placed in the tomb. And the tomb is not paradise. Reason number three is that in John chapter 20, verse 17, when Jesus finally rose from the dead and ran into Mary, and Mary fell down and, and wanted to grab him, Jesus said in John 20, verse 17, he said, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my Father. And that's on resurrection morning. So Jesus didn't go to paradise the day of his death. When he rose, he, he hadn't gone yet to be with his Father. And the last reason is because paradise is in heaven. When you compare uh, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7 with Revelation 22, the Bible says that you will eat the fruit of the tree of life in the paradise of God. And the paradise of God is where the tree of life is. And the tree of life is in heaven. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 22. I heard a story once about a, a lady that had a rather, uh, she had a, a husband, she loved her husband, they were you know, kind of well-to-do, and her, the lady was in Europe traveling around with some friends, but her husband wasn't with her, he was still in America. And, but the woman had the husband's credit card, and she found the dress of her dreams. It was such a beautiful dress, but it was rather expensive. So she wired her husband to see if it was okay for her to use the card and buy this dress. Good idea. <laughs> anyway, she did, and uh, the wire came back, and this is what the wire said. It said, no price is too high. So the woman thought, oh, my husband loves me. I love him too. No price is too high for me. So she bought the dress, and she uh, brought it home. And when she got back home, she walked in with this beautiful dress. Honey, look at me, the dress that you bought for me. And he looked at her. He was glad to see her, but he looked at her, and his mouth dropped open. He said, what? You bought that dress, that expensive dress? And she said, well, well, well yeah, you told me uh, that, that no price is too high. And then he said, oh, no. He said, honey, they, 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 they didn't put the comma in my, in my wire. My wire said, no, comma. The price is too high. <laughs> well, I'm sure they worked that out. But you get the picture that where commas go can make a difference. And we can't base a theology, especially on something so important as this, we can't base a theology on a comma. We have to base a theology on, on what the whole Bible has to say on a topic. Isn't that the safest thing to do? Okay, I know I'm running late, but I got to get to this. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5.8 and let's look at absent from the body. Got to look at this text because I've heard this so many times. People are questioning this and they say well Steve what about 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8 where Paul said to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord let's take a look at this verse 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 8 this is what Paul wrote Paul wrote we are he said first in verse 7 we walk by faith not by sight now it's faith one day it'll be sight verse uh, 8 he said, we are confident, yes, well-pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Here's the verse on the screen. Absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Now notice, Paul doesn't say to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says he wants to be absent from the body, which refers to the sinful body that he was still stuck in down here and to be present with the Lord. And, and the big question is, when does this transition take place? Does the transition from this body to being present with the Lord happen at the moment when you die? Or does the transition happen at the resurrection? 
That's the question. That's the dilemma. Which one is it? Is it death or the resurrection when we get to be with the Lord? Now, we don't have to guess. We actually, Paul actually gives us the answer. If you go back to verse 4, in the same chapter, just go back a couple of verses, notice what Paul says in verse 4. In verse 4, he says, we who are in this tent or this body, we groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality might be swallowed up by life. That's what he wants. He wants to get out of this sinful body. He wants to be clothed with his new body when mortality is swallowed up by life. Same transition. And again, the question is, when does this happen? When does the transition take place? At the moment of death or in the resurrection? Now, Paul actually answered that question. Notice where he said swallowed up by life. Do you see that in your Bibles? That mortality might be swallowed up by life. When does that happen? Back up a couple pages and go to chapter 15. 1 Corinthians 15. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul answers the question. In verses 51 to 55, he makes it very, very clear. Verse 50, Paul said, Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption, which is what we are now, inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. And then notice verse 54, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, notice, what's the next word there? He says, then, right, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where's your sting? O oh, grave, where's your victory? So look at the evidence here. 2 Corinthians 5.8, he wanted to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Verse 4 tells us that this happens when mortality is swallowed up by life. And in 1 Corinthians, he says the dead will be raised and this mortal, there's the word mortal, there's mortality, must put on immortality and that death will be swallowed up. They're swallowed up. Death is swallowed up in victory. And when is death swallowed up? When does this mortal become immortal? When do we get to be with the Lord? The answer is on resurrection day. When Jesus comes down and the dead are raised and the living are changed, then we get to be with him. I'm almost done. Here's a picture of a friend of mine that's no longer alive. Joe Cruz. I don't know how many of you have heard of Joe Cruz, but he used to be a, a powerful evangelist. His ministry was called Amazing Facts. And I was an Amazing Facts evangelist for, for a little over six years. I worked with this man. He trained me. He was a powerful preacher. He would stand up and he would go through text after text after text after text after text. And the amazing th thing about Joe Cruz was he didn't even use notes. I mean, I've got notes up here. Joe had no notes. He would just preach straight from the Bible. Well, I went to Russia with Joe for five weeks, trained under him during a big series, and when we came back uh, in October of 1994 in a hospital, he had a brain hemorrhage. The nurses actually double-dosed the Coumadin, I think it was Coumadin, which was a blood thinner, and they double-dosed him, and he had a brain hemorrhage, and he died in the hospital. And anyway, I was at his funeral. And this particular issue of the Inside Report, the Amazing Facts issue, describes Joe Cruz, founder of Amazing Facts, born December 28, 1924, died October 10, 1994. And I was at his funeral service. And there were people there from around the world. People from India. People from different countries had come to pay their final respects to this godly man. And I remember his ca I was one of the pallbearers. And we carried this uh, casket to the center of this church, packed church. And then we sat down, and a man named Bill May stood up and gave the funeral address. 
and it was very, very touching. I mean, it just moved all of us. And when he got to the end of his address, the casket was still open. Joe, I mean, Bill May looked down as they closed the casket after the final viewing. They closed the casket, and this is what Bill said. He looked at Joe for the last time, and he said, I still remember it, he said, good night, Joe. See ya in the morning. See ya in the morning. Oh, I tell you, it just, it just touched. It just touched all of us. And that's what's going to happen when Jesus Christ comes. Last verse, and then we'll have our closing song. First Thessalonians, we open this t- with this text. Let's finish with it. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16, 17, and 18. And again, we need to base our doctrines not on one or two texts, but on what the whole Bible has to say. Verse 16, Paul wrote, he said, The Lord himself, he will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, And the dead in Christ, they will rise first around the world. Cemeteries will crack. Tombstones will crack. And people who have been laid in their graves, God's people will rise in Russia, in China, in South America, in Israel, in Canada, and throughout North America, in Mansfield, in Dallas-Fort Worth, all around the world. God's people, they will rise on resurrection day. I heard about an old saint on his deathbed. He said, if you miss me, don't dismay. I may have to rest in a mound of clay, but when I hear that trumpet sound, I'm coming out of the cold, cold ground. Hallelujah. And then verse 17 says, then we who are alive and remain we will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus, Paul says in the King James, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's what he says. And the last verse, verse 18, Paul says, therefore comfort one another with these words. These are words of comfort and words of truth to inspire us. Brother Nevel, we're ready for you. To inspire us that no matter how dark or painful or confusing it is in this world, Jesus is going to come and raise the dead and unite us with the living and we're going to be with him forever and ever and ever. Isn't that good news? I like it. Come, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Nabil. The time has come, child of God, for you to close your eyes and sleep. To take your final breath and to be laid to rest in peace in the resurrection make sure to look for me and I will look for you and together we will go Together we will hear him say, well done. But first you will rise. And together we will meet him in the skies. Our joy will be complete when we cast all our crowns at Jesus' feet. Then we will be together We will be together
together. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Set your mind on things above. Remember the promises he made. Our lives are hidden with Christ in God together. And together we will go. Together we will hear him say, well done but first you will rise and together we will meet him in the skies our joy will be complete when we cast all our crowns at jesus feet then we will be together If we trust in him who has the power to save, we will have the victory over death and the grave. I'll show you a mystery, we will not all sleep. For God himself, he has promised, our lives he will keep. There are crowns awaiting everyone who love is appearing. And together we will go, together we will hear him say, well done. But first you will rise. And together we will meet him in the skies. Our joy will be complete when we cast all our crowns at Jesus' feet. And then we will be together. I can't wait to see on the sea of glass praising his name together hallelujah you and I together perfect brother thank you Wonderful. Perfect song. That was a, a God thing, as they say. The Lord led in that. Okay, well, tomorrow night, 1,000 years on the lake of fire. It's going to be a wonderful topic. We're going to be studying Revelation chapter 20. So if you want to do your homework between now and then, just open your Bibles and read Revelation 20. And we'll be going through that chapter from top to bottom to see what it really says what it doesn't say, and again, I'll prove to you that the first resurrection is at the beginning of the thousand years, the second resurrection is the end of the thousand years, and then we'll find out what will ultimately happen to those that are in the wrong resurrection uh, on Monday night when we study the hot topic of hell. So very important subjects. I hope that you'll come and stick with me. Thank you for being such a good audience. I appreciate uh, your prayers, and I'm praying for you too. Let's stand and have the benediction. And again, we have study guides for you when you leave. Let's pray. 
dear Father and dear Jesus, oh God, thank you for opening our eyes to your word. And Lord, ever since the days of Adam and Eve, you've been watching the heartache and the pain of sin in this world and all the people that have died and have been laid to rest. And Jesus, thank you so much that you came down here. You became a man. You took the sin of the whole world and on that cruel cross, you died and you really did die. You really did die for us. You were laid in that tomb and then on Sunday morning, you really did rise from the dead. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And now you're up in heaven and we're waiting down here. We're waiting for you to come back to raise the dead of all ages and to change us and to take us home to be with you forever. May that day come soon, we pray. In your name, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Good night. God bless you. Thanks for being here.